So I'm just really excited to be here, you guys. I'm super grateful to be able to be with my family. You guys truly are a special part of my heart. This morning, uh, I wanted to preach a lesson that uh, was talked about yesterday at our staff meeting, where we talked about how the battle belongs to God. Uh, this week, I was able to watch the movie 12 Strong with my father. I don't know who here likes those like war movies. I'm a huge fan. And so the movie 12 Strong, it talks about the first attack from the U.S back to the Middle East after 9-11, the Twin Towers came down. It was a group of 12 soldiers that were sent to Afghanistan to meet up with someone from the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, and they were trying to overthrow one of the capital cities in the Middle East. What was amazing is that these men, it was just 12 of them. And it really hit my heart because it's like, when you have a group of men and women that are sold out to do something, nothing is impossible. But not only that, Nothing is impossible if they're serving the Almighty God. Amen? Amen. This movie goes ahead and follows the life of uh, Lieutenant Mitch. And what's incredible is that this man goes ahead and leads the, the, the men that are with his unit. And they ride on horseback because they couldn't use cars to go over the mountain ranges at where they were at. And so these men were literally going into battle against tanks, RPGs, AK-47s on a horseback. I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound like a smart battle plan. And what's amazing is that I see the same thing in the scriptures time and time again. God calls his people to do something that is considered foolish by the world. But yet he makes it awesome and is glorified through it. Amen. The title of the lesson this morning is the battle is God's, not yours. Let's turn our Bibles over to Exodus 14, 14. I love the book of Exodus because I relate a lot with Moses. I'm an angry person. I mean, trust me, this morning getting here from, from where I'm at, I had to cross over the bridge and the tolls and, and then waiting for, for slow people that are running in the marathon. But Ray is one of the fast ones. Amen. And what's amazing is that I find myself so often falling short in patience, but yet God never falls short in that. Let's check this verse out in verse 14, Exodus 14. It says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now, I don't know about you guys, but having someone fight for me is the most encouraging thing ever. I haven't had it happen. You know, I was in middle school at one point, and I went ahead and had to fight this young man who kind of threw a, my friend's book bag across the, the basketball court, and I thought I was tough, and I was like, no, you're not going to do that. And, and he was a lot taller than I was. He was more developed. I was short and stubby. And what was crazy is that he went ahead and we fought. And it was weird because I didn't have anyone fighting for me. So I literally was standing there, and he's hitting my back, and in my heart, I'm crying. My mom works at the school, so I didn't want to fight back because then my mom would find out and then the second coming of Jesus would happen. <laughs> and so I went ahead and I, fought, and I stood there and I just took the beating. And I realized that it's awesome when someone can go ahead and fight your battles for you. Now, I'm not saying about, I'm not talking about God, you know, making it so that your life is super easy. But what I'm saying is about God actually going ahead and going before you in the battle in everything, in your spiritual walk, in your physical walk, in your emotional walk, God will fight for you. Amen? Amen? God loves His people. And there was four specific things that I wanted to talk about when it comes to the battle that we need to go ahead and actually have in our mindset as we go ahead and take on this incredible war for God. There was a quote that was used in the movie that I wanted to share with you guys because I don't know about you guys, but sometimes there's just incredible uh, quotes used in movies. When uh, Lieutenant Mitch was getting his, uh, his direction for the battle, he went ahead and went over to the Middle East, like I said, and he met with this, uh, this uh, basically it was a war general. And he went ahead and they had a conversation, the Americans with the, uh, the Afghanistan warriors. And this was what the lieutenant from the Afghanistan uh, remnant uh, battalion went ahead and told the U.S. soldier. He said, your mission will fail if you fear death. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't, really, I don't really consider myself somebody that gets scared a lot. I get spooked easily. You could ask Andres this morning. I woke up at like 5.30. I was in the, in the kitchen, and he pops up. He goes, good morning. And it's, and it's like pitch black. And I was like, oh, shit. And I just started like dancing around, like freaking out. And I realized that with God, he's never afraid. I wanted to show us the scripture in Psalm 46 to show us how awesome our God is this morning. Let's go to Psalm 46 if you can. And what I love about the Psalms is that a lot of them are songs. They're actual songs that are sung. 
That's why I think it's, it's so important that we worship God with all of our heart. I appreciate Adrian and the song leaders. Just, it's not about how talented you sound or how cool you look with the snaps and the claps. It's about who you're worshiping this morning. I want to ask you, who are you worshiping? God or yourself? Psalm 46. It says in verse 1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. I don't know about you guys, but when I raise my voice, nothing really happens. God raises His voice, the earth melts. How awesome is our God? But the first point of our lesson this morning as we find out that the battle is God's and not ours is we need to understand this simple concept. Do not fear, for He is near. Amen? We see here in verse 1 it says, God is our strength and our refuge, an ever-present help in trouble. I don't know about you guys, but it feels amazing. It feels so amazing when you're just crying out for help and God's right there. Yeah. And it's not there that he, like he shows up physically. It doesn't like he speaks to you audibly because, guys, I don't know about you, but like if God were to speak to me, I'd probably like be like, what? I don't know what to do. But yet he speaks to us through his word. He shows himself through the men and women who call themselves and are living out the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yeah. We will not fear because he is our strength and our refuge. Our sister Helen Sullivan yesterday at a staff meeting went ahead and shared about how it hit her heart, the, the, this concept that God is her strength, not herself. And I thought about it a little bit more and I'm like, wow, so often I can go ahead and decide that I'm going to be my strength. I'm going to be my refuge. I'm going to use my talent. I'm going to use my persona. I'm going to use my charisma. I'm going to use my resources to provide for myself instead of have God be the great provider that he has always been. Amen. I realize that in our fear, we don't move. We don't change. We're not willing to understand and accept the fact that God is God and we are but mortals like our brother Andres prayed. We are not to fear, for He is near. For us, what do you fear? What, what, what do you fear? Are you afraid of being alone? It says here that God is our refuge. Are you afraid of being an outsider because of what you claim is your faith? Are you afraid of losing loved ones? We have to see that God himself, he's always going to be there. A refuge, a shelter. He is going to be a help that's always coming through. How can we have fear when we know this? And I think it's because of one simple thing. We know the scriptures, but we don't believe them. We know it up here, but it hasn't made its way down to our heart. This morning, I want to challenge you. Do not fear, for He is near. Believe the scriptures in their entirety. If God says He loves you, I'm going to tell you what, He loves you. There's no other way around it. The truth of the scriptures are always going to be fact. We go ahead and um, I wanted to show a scripture that uh, uh, hit my heart during one of my quiet times. This is John chapter 3. We could turn our Bibles there. And Jesus himself addresses why people are scared. Hey, it's crazy. It's crazy. John chapter 3. Mind you, this is in context to Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, and he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was a religious guy. But yet he didn't know the principles of salvation. I don't know about you guys, but that, 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 that was me before I was a disciple. Religious as can be. Dancing around, screaming and hollering, Sunday morning, ask me what I did for the rest of the week, and I wouldn't even remember it. Do not fear, for the Lord is here. John chapter 3, verse 19. Let's read that. It says here, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely agree with that scripture. I could write down the list. I could write down the list of all the evil deeds I've done. And I'm sure a lot of us can. 
But there's a difference between the man that lives in darkness and the man that lives in the light. Let's keep reading in verse 20. It says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Jesus goes ahead and just lays it on out. We're scared because we don't want to be exposed. That's why I find it so funny. I went to high school in an inner city and uh, when somebody would roast somebody, they'd be like, expose him. And they would like, they would like roast the person, and just make fun of them. Roast him, expose him. And it's like, I realize no one likes to be exposed because at that point you can't hide behind the facade, the mask, the jokes. Now the real true you comes out. But what's amazing is that with God, we don't have to be insecure about it. We just got to be in the light. I want to ask you this morning, are you in the light? And not, and not like it's some kind of weird spiritual thing that you kind of get, you know, touched and it happens. You know what I'm talking about? Are you in the light when it comes to your relationship with God? Yeah. It says in Isaiah 59 that our sin separates us from God. Has that wall of sin been taken down in your life? And if it has, is it staying down? Verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth and comes into the light, I love how this finishes up, so that it may be plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I don't know about you guys, but the moment that we start being open with God and telling Him, hey God, I struggle with pride. God, I'm insecure. I treat you the way that I treat my own physical father because of how hurt I am. The moment we get real with God like that is the moment we're in the light with Him. Because no longer is it kind of like, God, I trust you. You're awesome. Yay. But now it's like, God, I'm broken. I, I have nothing. I appreciate Sherry sharing. Her. She was like shaking her fist to God. Like, God, why did you do this to me? God, why is my life falling apart around me? And you're not doing anything about it. Now, that's good. That's honesty. But at the same time, we have to have gratitude and understand what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that he loves us. That those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Isaiah 40. It's one of the greatest passages of scripture ever. But it only happens if we have the conviction that we will not fear. For he is near. Amen? Yeah. The second thing we need to definitely bring into battle. Is point number two. Trust in him to forgive your sin. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm trying to do a little bit of what Matt does. And kind of get you know creative with the points. <laughs> Try to engage us a little bit. Um, I used to rap back in Gainesville. But this Sunday is for the Lord. It's never going to be for me, guys. I wanted us to read the story of Nicodemus himself and see his heart. To see, like, like guys, like, this is how a religious person responds to Jesus. So it's going to happen today when you share your faith with somebody like this. Now let's see how he responded. And let's trust in him who forgives our sin. Let's check it out in verse 1, guys. Come on. John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Like, guys, Jesus was that guy. Jesus was the GOAT. The GOAT is an acronym for the greatest of all time. Jesus pulled up and did the greatest miracles possible. But what was incredible, it wasn't just so that he can look cool, but so that he can say, guys, I'm here to save you. It's not about me getting exalted. It's not me about getting the money. It's not me about getting the fame. It's about God receiving glory to his name. Amen. We go ahead and see Jesus' heart here when he talks right here in verse 3. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you. When you know Jesus opens up with very truly I tell you, we got to go ahead and pay attention. Amen? Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Well, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. You know that, Jesus. <laughs> You're smart enough, Jesus. And then Jesus hits him with the left in verse 5. He says, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. When Jesus says you can't enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit, it means you cannot enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. When the scriptures say something like this, guys, it needs to be a conviction. 
If it says you repent and you are baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you receive the Holy Spirit, I'll keep going down there if you need me to. It means it. You repent, you're baptized, and your sins are all washed away. And then you live in gratitude for what God has done. And your life makes an impact in this lost world. Amen? Amen. So if Jesus says you got to be born again, then what does that mean, guys? Well, congratulations, guys. You know the scriptures a little bit more. That's amazing. (laughs) Check this out, what it says, though. In verse 6, flesh flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Guys, Jesus, he he didn't do this just so that he can make fun of Nicodemus. I'm saying it in a mocking tone because, guys, it's hard to talk to religious people that don't want to accept the true gospel. It's hard. And then what I love about Jesus is that he just says the same point over and over again. And then he says this to Nicodemus. Check this out. Let's drop down all the way to verse 9. It says, Nicodemus asks, how can this be? How can it be that you have to be born again? That doesn't make sense. Verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things. And you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Guys, I love Jesus. Jesus doesn't go ahead and try to blow your mind with all this information. He he gives it to you in chunks. I want to ask you this morning, do you know and are you secure in your salvation? Is it according to the scriptures or according to sentimentality? According to what your mama told you, what your grandma told you, what a cool person on TV said that had a nice jacket? Or is it based off of the scriptures of our Most High God? I want to give us a practical I want you to be convinced that you are saved. Because if you're convinced that you're saved in your heart and you believe it, your life's going to change. No longer is it, oh, my sins are washed away, but no, it's I am a forgiven son of God. And I will live my life in gratitude for my Father in heaven. We have to be convinced. Even as disciples, we need to know the truth. A lot of times we're ashamed of the truth. I don't know why we do that. The scriptures say something, but we got to say it in love. Like, if we know somebody is hurting and, and we're trying to go ahead and win them over with cool, cool sayings and like, hey, uh, check my slogan out for repentance and baptism, instead of using the scriptures, of course we're not going to impact people's hearts. we got to show them the love that Jesus did. Jesus was willing to talk to Nicodemus at night. I don't know about you guys, but when it's nighttime, I want to go to sleep. I want to go ahead and turn on TNT, watch the Heat win the games that they won. They won last night against the Charlotte Bobcats. Praise him, praise him. But I want to go ahead and go to sleep. And Jesus' heart was, no, I want to stay up and talk to this man as long as it takes. Interestingly enough, in John chapter 7, and verse 50 to 53, Nicodemus actually goes ahead and supports Jesus in front of the rest of the Jewish ruling council. He says, how can we go ahead and judge someone that we haven't even heard him speak yet? And I, was, and I read that and I was like, it just shows one moment with Jesus and your life's changed forever. Wow. One moment in his scriptures and your life has changed forever. We need to trust in him who frees us from our sin as we understand that the battle is his and not ours. Amen? Yeah. There's a saying, this was done in the old movement. I know some of uh, the awesome brothers and sisters from back in the day. The saying was, uh, hear, believe, repent, confess, and get baptized. That was, that was it. You hear the message, you go ahead and believe it, you definitely got to repent. Yeah. You confess that Jesus is Lord, and you get splashed and dunked in some water. It's that simple. And the scriptures lay it out even more simply. Like verbatim, it says, you cannot be saved unless you're baptized. And it's like, wow, that's good. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I confuse myself with the scriptures. I'm like, oh, what did God mean here? Did God mean something that I don't even know of? It's like, no, the scriptures are straightforward. You got to be born again and enter the kingdom of God. Everybody that's here that's a part of God's kingdom has been born again. Amen? And I don't know about you guys, but I'm glad that that happened. Because I don't know about y'all, but there are some sins that we've all committed that are kind of like ill, like get out of my face here. And what's amazing is that with Jesus and with God, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. Are we convinced of that? And are we living like that today, guys? Or are we still living as if? We were in the world. We need to be convinced and trust in him who frees us from our sin. Point number three, the why that makes you cry. 
We're going to talk about the mission of a disciple here. There was another quote in the movie when, uh, when the lieutenant was getting his charge, his, his, uh, his task to go to Afghanistan. He said, the most important thing a soldier can take into battle is a reason why. And that hits my heart. The most important reason why someone chooses to be a disciple is the reason why. Why are you a disciple of Jesus Christ this morning? Is it because someone went ahead and convinced you with their cool words? Or is it because of the fact that you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? And now it's a matter of living life in gratitude and in complete submission to his scriptures. Those of us that are here that are not baptized disciples, I want to encourage you, study the Bible. Guys, this group is so loving. I mean, I don't know people that are willing to wait in traffic for hours to be able to worship God like this. People can go ahead and wait for five minutes. They'll turn around, get a U-turn, and go eat some breakfast with the family. And to believe that each and every person that came here, not, not only came here to go ahead and, you know, spend time with the family, but came here to serve. Guys, that breakfast was amazing. Like, those bananas were fresh. But I want to ask us, what is the why that makes you cry? Every disciple has to answer that question. Why are you here today? Guys, we're not here to put on a show. And that hurts my heart because for the longest time as a disciple, it's been a show. It's been how cool can I look? How good can I sing? How well can I preach the word, like the brothers would say? And none of that even matters. And I realized that with Jesus' heart, he had a why that made him cry. He saw the people, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, he saw the people were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. For me, guys, the reason, the why that makes me cry is my family. As my family is lost, and every day I see it. I see my brothers coming home at 5 in the morning. I see my dad and my mom fighting every day. I see my parents getting, my grandparents getting divorced. My family is falling apart. It's because of Satan's grip in this city. What's the why that makes you cry? Why are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? I'm a disciple because I want my dad to be a disciple. I want my mom to be a disciple. I want all of my friends from high school, my cousins, the people that I, that I sin with here. I want to repent and I want to show them, guys, it's not, we don't have to do that. Four days ago, I was sitting down at a park near my house, and I sat on a bench that I used to sit there for hours and smoke with friends from church. Four years ago, that was me. And I sat there and I had a quiet time with God. And I was like, God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I did this to you. I'm sorry that I fell short every day. I'm sorry that I'm not good enough. And I realized that God's scriptures are good enough. Yeah because it's not about just, just going ahead and being broken, but it's about being broken and repenting and changing this world for Christ. This morning, I don't want us to be just downcast and depressed about things, but I want us to be broken, repent, and go ahead and impact some lives because the why that makes us cry. Amen. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus gave the great commission and the disciples needed to know why they were going to go ahead and do it. Matthew 28, in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. I love how Jesus keeps his word. I barely keep my word. I tell people I'm going to be somewhere at 10 in the morning and I'm there at 10.05. I tell people I'm going to give this much and I fail and I fall short. Jesus never fell short on his word. And I love the fact that he went ahead and instilled this, this confidence in the men he led. He said, guys, I have all authority on heaven and on earth. That's why you're doing what you're doing for me. He's the why that makes us cry. Jesus didn't have to come down here and give us the great commission. He could have said, guys, I'm going to do this and... Honestly, I don't think you guys are going to be motivated enough to even change. Wow. Jesus pulls these men aside after three and a half years of showing them exactly how to live a righteous and great life with God. And says, guys, this is the last thing I got to say to you. Go and make disciples. 
baptize them, teach them to obey, and I'll be with you till the end of the age. I want to ask us, church, is that our mission statement? Do we believe the scriptures? Guys, if you've noticed, the church, honestly, this church is amazing. But we've been a little slow this year. Slow in different areas in our sacrifice, in our love towards one another. I still don't know everybody's life personally. And it's already been six months. We, don't, we fall short when it comes to evangelism. People aren't being saved. Now, it's incredible that we have people that are saved. That's amazing. That's something to rejoice about. But when there is no additions, it's just like a tree and a plant. If it's not growing, it's dying. Yep. I want to ask us this morning, will we repent? Individually, every single person, will you repent? Amen. Will you repent? Will you repent? Will you repent? I will repent. On, Guys, let's make this week one that's glorious for God. Super Bowl Sunday is next Sunday. We're doing a Bring Your Neighbor Day. Guys, it's not about numbers. I want us to bring at least two friends with us. That's all I ask. Amen. And not even just so it's like, oh, Big service for, for cool church people. No, it's so more people can hear the gospel. Yeah. The unadulterated gospel. Like that would be super awesome to have 200 people at church. And then we could all sing awesome songs. And like the song leader sounded great today and we're outside. And we all sounded awesome. Yeah. Now it's not because we're all talented, but because we're worshiping God. And when you're doing it for God, everything works out. Yeah. But we need to have a why that makes us cry. This week I'm going to call up all of the Live Talk leaders. Guys, I need the Live Talk leaders to take care of the flocks. We need to repent. We need to take care of our family. Make this next Sunday one that's glorious for God. And let's get this church back to where the scriptures say that we should be. A church that not even the gates of Hades can prevail over. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's an amazing calling. Let's go ahead and be that church. Amen? Amen. Point number four. Lord, the price of life is sacrifice. How many parents we have here today? Raise your hand, please. Moms and dads, amazing. The one word I can think of when I think of a parent is sacrifice. You give of yourself so your children can be better. It's the most beautiful thing ever. That's why I think it's awesome that God is the Father. He sacrifices for His children. He sacrificed Jesus, the one and only Son. It was like Hans talked about yesterday. You had one dollar? and you have to give it up. God had all of the riches in the world and he gave it up just so that you could be here this morning. Talk about love, amen? But now, as a result of that, we need to have a response. Sacrifice as well. Guys, great parents make great children who make great parents. That's why I think of the little kids in Kids Kingdom, they're awesome. Some of them are so well-mannered, it's, it's like, are you like 18? <laughs> and then Noah's like, no. And he like runs around and then kicks me, but it's cute. Um, but I realize it, it's all about sacrifice. Guys, this church is so sacrificial. Guys, what you've done in the last six months, it's unprecedented. A church being planted with 71 people, moving 71 people? I'm Hispanic and moving 71 people seems a lot to me. <laughs> Raising over $36,000 for missionary work? Guys. You're awesome. And our God is awesome and he deserves it. Guys, seeing the baptism, seeing the brothers and sisters that are here, Juan, seeing Pilar, seeing Maisha, Zykea, so many amazing people because of what God has done. Because we've had, and we've had the heart to know that the price is sacrifice. We're going to close things out here. And I want to share one last scripture in Acts chapter 2. I love the book of Acts because it shows us exactly how the church should be. It's a, 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 like, honestly, this is exactly how the church should be. If your church is not like this, what I'm about to read right now, leave the church and find a church that does. Amen. Study the Bible with a church that does this. Amen. Check this out in verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It goes in and reads, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers had everything in common and were together. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. So it wasn't just at the church building. 
Sorry about that. Thank you. One second. Need to adjust the phone. But um, the heart of the disciples, they were willing to spend time with each other in their homes. Show me a disciple, a disciple is someone that has hospitality. Who do I think of? Jack and Jeannie McGee. Who do I think of? The sisters household in Coral Gables. Who do I think of? The brothers in Hialeah who always have food for all the brothers. Joshua Galindo and Andres, you guys are awesome. And I think of so many other disciples. But I want us to get to the point that we're all in accordance to the scriptures as a church. Said all of the believers, even the teens, were hospitable. Even the teens. Look at Jonathan's glasses. They're beautiful. Willy Wonka. They look great. The lifestyle of a disciple is defined in one word as we see it here. Sacrifice. Sacrifice for God. Sacrifice for people of God. And sacrifice for the lost. Who will one day be the people of God. I want us to look at verse 46 real quick. Sorry, verse 45. It says, They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's just something about eating food with your brothers and sisters. It's so fun. Uh, the live talk over at uh, FIU, we had some dinner Thursday night. Some fettuccine alfredo with beef that, that, that Deborah just whipped up with. Alicia was fuego. And then Friday night, we had Devo at Matt and Helen's place. And it was double fuego. It was great because it was all about family and how to have a heart that's ready to go and do something great for God. Guys, as a church, we need to spend time together. I love, I love, I love what the Spanish Bible Talk is doing. You guys are awesome. Like, honestly, I don't know how you guys are all in shape from how much you guys eat together. It's incredible. But church, all of us have to have that same heart. The heart to be willing to sell possessions to give to those who have need. Guys, we have to be willing to go ahead and tell people when we're in need. I'm going to be honest with you. I love when a brother and sister say, hey, can I get a ride somewhere? I'm willing to give you $2 for gas. And I know those $2 are the most that they can give. And it's like, dude, hop on in. Use the $2 for like a McDouble or something at Burger King. Don't worry about it. Or uh, McDonald's, sorry. You can't do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll be stoned. You guys will stone me as, as, uh, when I preach up here. But it's a heart that we need to have as a church. I think we're doing great as a church. But we can do magnificent as a church. That's the kind of church God came to plant. A church that not even the gates of hell will overcome. The last thing I want to share was verse 47. It says, Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's not man. It's not man that goes ahead and makes it so people are saved. It's only God. We got to understand that the four points this morning, it, it, you know, we can be as close to God and as in the light, as, as evangelistic, as sacrificial as possible, but we need to understand one thing. The victory only comes from God because He's the one that fights for us. A practical I wanted to give us. Let's sacrifice for God, guys. Guys, our, our contribution right now, guys, you guys are blowing my mind. We're at an average of $52, $53 per member. Guys, we have teenagers in this church. We have people without jobs in this church. And we're each giving an average of $53? Only God can do that. You know what I mean? Like that, That's the only explanation. But I want to call us to be more sacrificial. Guys, there's people in here that can't do it. Honestly, God has been just blessing certain people with great jobs. It's awesome. And then they share about it, and then we're all like, yeah! And then the best thing that I love hearing is, and I'm going to raise my contribution. And I'm like, you better do it, Jay. <laughs> Second thing I want to call us a sacrifice in. From the scriptures, we see that they're willing to sell possessions to give to anyone who had need. Guys, we have special missions coming up. And I already have had brothers and sisters go up to me and they're like, so bro, I got $100 turned in this Sunday. And they just walk off and I'm like, what are you? That's amazing. <laughs> to be able to give each of us $500 a member. To go ahead and evangelize the city even more. Guys, like. I can't wait. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. But we have to stick to his word, stick to each other, and especially stick to Jesus. Amen? For next Sunday, let's make it an awesome Sunday. Let's move the church daily, not monthly, not 
bi-weekly, like I'm talking about like daily. Every day, keep in contact with the disciples. Share your faith with one another. Pray with one another. Go ahead and live life with one another. Have fun. I heard the teens yesterday went to Dave and Buster's. And my bitterness is at an all-time low right now. It was pretty bad when I heard about it the first time. But I realized that that's what it's all about. It's, it's all about family. Guys, let's be family till the end. Amen? So as we conclude, guys, kind of took a, a note from Matt Sullivan's book. If you get point number one, you get the word do. You go to point number two, trust in him to forgive your sin. The word trust. And make sure that you know your salvation biblically, amen? You get the first word from point number three, the why that makes you cry, the. Point number four, Lord, the price of life is sacrifice. We see that we have to always do trust the Lord. And the battle is God's, not ours, amen? Amen, you guys. That's the lesson.